First of all, I want to thank you for joining this event and extend a welcome from us and from the Green European Foundation organizing this event in the frame of the project Cities as Places of Hope. Some technical information in the beginning. The event will be recorded. We'll have simultaneous translation in Macedonian and English. By clicking the button on the right bottom corner of the screen enables changing the language from English to Macedonian and vice versa. In order to have this option, however, you must download the latest update of this Zoom application. This is the second of a big series of events that will take place in the next period throughout Europe. Joining us are representatives of the Greens and Municipality Councils throughout Macedonia. We have green activists from around the country and together we'll share initiatives from the country. Same initiatives can be found in Europe. We'll see their experiences for making cities the places for sustainable future. During the project implementation and afterwards, available for you will be the researches made by us and also by partners around Europe. And this event is a continuation of the research and the mapping of progressive and transformative practices in Western Balkans, done by us as a partner. And we will see practices mapped by the other partners cooperating with us. Uh, practices and possibilities around you for cities and municipalities to self-organize through building and membership in translocal networks of European cities through which they will connect with the green movement in Europe and accomplish their goals for greening the cities. This event is named Talking About Green Cities where organizations taking part in the project are from several European countries. We have also municipality councillors, green activists, and we hope for representatives of translocal international networks who will perhaps join us later in the event, international networks of green cities, and we'll have a chance to discuss initiatives and hopefully in the end we can address the response to COVID-19 crisis affecting us all from local to central level, and it's in our homes already. A big part of Europe is in quarantine, as well as our neighbors in the Balkans. And if we have time, we can discuss how cities respond to COVID crisis. In the first part of this event, addressing will be Member of Parliament Maya Moracanin on the importance of trade training for green activists and councillors on these local topics for greening the cities. From the project leaders, apart from me as coordinator in Macedonia, addressing you will be Kati van de Velde, leader of the GIF project Cities as Places of Hope. She's an international coordinator of Oikos think tank from Belgium. She will introduce us in the project and speak about a different, different vision of Europe and will point out why cities are so important in these changes throughout Europe. In the second part, speaking will be councillors from several cities. Hrista Naidayanov, councillor in the city of Skopje. Sretimir Nikolovski, councillor in the municipality of Kriva Palanka. Svetlana Stanovska, councillor in the municipality of Probištip, and Ivana Zdraveska, councillor in the municipality of Aerodrom uh, from the city of Skopje. Uh, in the chat box, I sent a link you can register on to receive information on topics addressed by the Green European Foundation and the Green European Journal. And that way you can keep up with the latest events in the EU and wider. 
In the first part, while the speakers are addressing, I would ask you to mute your microphones and afterwards we will have a discussion. I would like to invite to address the president and leader of the Green Party Dom, also a member of parliament, Maya Muracani. Thank you, Alexander. Good evening and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to address you. It is my great pleasure to see this choice of topic about green cities um, that DOM is working on years back, which is one of our main program commitments, but also what we work on daily basis on central level as members of parliament, but especially our councillors in local municipalities where they are elected. This way of exchanging experiences, especially in cooperation with our friends from Europe, from where we can uh, import and apply experiences here this way of cooperation is useful and drives towards true improvement improvement of the state and uh, especially towards our priority to green the cities we live in as in the world also in Macedonia, two-thirds of the populations live in the cities. That's a trend that probably will continue in the future. The population in the cities will rise and that is not a sustainable way to develop cities. And what is one of the crucial needs is to give more attention and to stimulate citizens to stay in rural areas and uh, smaller or urban areas and uh, not to go to the big cities. But that is probably another topic that also should be addressed as well how to provide conditions for quality life and existence outside the big cities so people would not be motivated to leave their hometowns and uh, move to the big cities. On today's topic of discussion, uh, I will address mostly even though this is a wide concept, I will try to focus on three to four key moments I think are important for our cities, especially for Skopje, as the biggest city with the highest number of inhabitants, probably over 700, 800,000 inhabitants, a city that was planned in the past for almost half of that number. Uh, some sustainable way of life, it was estimated that Skopje can provide conditions for adequate living of around 400,000 inhabitants. What we see now is uh, doubling the number of inhabitants and additionally the people that travel for work in Skopje, migrate to Skopje, and all this burdens the city and decreases the quality of life from the aspect of uh, traffic intensity, which is also one of the key factors of pollutions. The increased number of people in the city decreases the quality of life. It increases the need for construction of housing facilities. And uh, what we witness in the past decades is the construction expansion. 
especially in the capital, Skopje, and specifically in the center of the city, and usually destroying the free green areas, which also contributes for increased pollution and uh, decreased quality of life. Because there are less and less green spaces, less area for social activities, and uh, of course the infrastructure is not dimensioned to service the rising number of facilities and population. Mm, there is also lack of schools, health facilities, all that citizens need on a daily basis. And uh, all this is contributing to decreased quality of life and even deteriorating health of the citizens. That is why DOM, as a political party, uh, in the key activities has um, the urban planning. All our councillors, um, also those present today here, uh, who will surely share their experiences in the struggle against hyper-urbanization, that we fight for years so we can truly in the urban plans contribute uh, to see this development in a sustainable and in a green way. Uh, what is a big challenge in, in all the cities in Macedonia is the illegal landfills uh, the dumps, waste dumps, which the municipalities uh, started seriously dealing with and have some progress. Our councillors uh, from different cities a year or two ago uh, took part in such activities together with the citizens and the local authorities in uh, mapping the illegal landfills and also in closing and cleaning uh, and uh, after that the recuperation uh, which is of great importance as a source of uh, pollution of uh, the water, the soil, the air in the cities but also from a hygienic and aesthetic uh, reasons it decreases the quality of life. I hope some of the councillors present and the activists will share experience from those activities. Uh, so, uh, through the exchange of experiences, other councillors and activists and stakeholders on, on different levels in institutions can implement these positive examples in solving the problem of illegal landfills. Of course, uh, in this area, key task is introducing a waste management system, uh, a modern one. But I hope uh, next year, the first regional landfill construction will start and uh, Probably in the next uh, two or three years, uh, it will start functioning. This will seriously contribute to modernized waste management and solving uh, the decades-long problem of illegal landfills and uh, waste dumps. Um, these are perhaps key topics we have worked on through different initiatives on uh, central and local level and uh, I think that it is important to share our experiences. Um, in the third part uh, I want to address uh, uh, is the need for a bigger involvement of uh, citizens as well 
as in uh, subsidies and help in the use of renewable sources of energy because in our cities, especially in Skopje, Tetovo, Bitola, uh, the air pollution is a major problem and often, unfortunately, among uh, the top cities in Europe uh, with the air pollution levels. And precisely the transition from fossil fuels to new renewable energy sources, primarily the sun and the wind, is one of the key factors in the solving this problem. This additionally positively contributes in the fight with climate change, but also contributes in increasing the family budget. Uh, when citizens get the opportunity from photovoltaics to produce electricity, and that will also generate substantial savings. In that area, I think uh, legislation should be improved. So I think that uh, it will be a challenge for the coming period that we need to work seriously and just to round up I will give a short introduction to something I feel is very important for sustainable development of the cities and especially in this COVID-19 pandemic uh, was emphasized more uh, that's the need of uh, digitalization and what we are working on uh, the concept of smart cities which simplify life but also positively affect environmental protection and the climate. And I think uh, digitalization as a process is something that Macedonia in the future needs to invest more. Uh, and intensify the process. Um, I'm here for questions and uh, I'm eager to hear your experiences and of course uh, new ideas and suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you Maya. Uh, truly well said and um, now we will continue with the presentation with uh, Kati van de Velde, the leader of the project uh, Cities of as Places of Hope. Uh, she is the international coordinator of Oikos think tank from Belgium. She will tell us a bit more about the project and open a different vision of the European Union in which cities are most important, uh, most efficient in creating these changes in Europe. I will um, share my presentation. I prepared a presentation that will make it easier. Uh, like this. Does this work? Do you see this? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, we can yeah. see it. And uh, you are translated into Macedonian. Everything is working well. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Continue. So, good evening. Um, and thank you for inviting me on this, this webinar. Uh, so yes, on behalf of the Belgian uh, green think tank Oikos, um, I'm happy to talk about more a bit more about this project. Um, and to share uh, another vision on, on the European Union, because um, we all share this, this um, logic and dominant vision on the European Union as a cooperation between member states with its successes and its difficulties. And um, I think it's clear that the European Union is, is currently facing huge challenges. The, public and political debate is dominated by migration, climate change, fair and healthy food, sustainable mobility, etc. 
we also see um, nation states turning away from the union and becoming more protectionist. They start using isolation more as an answer to challenges than, than, than cooperation. Look at Brexit. Also, the EU has a strong focus on economy and the free market, but its social and environmental agenda is insufficient. On the other hand, however, and I'm going to the next slide. On the other hand, however, the European Union also has a rich landscape of progressive cities developing transformative projects and, and policies for food, mobility, agriculture, energy, circular economy. And there appears to be a clear difference between national governance and, and local governance. Some national governance for governments, for instance, they invest in the automobile industry. They build more motorways to be able to accommodate more cars. While many cities are currently actually investing in the mobility of tomorrow, making streets and city centers car free. In a few minutes, I'll, I'll be happy to go more into detail on this because here in Belgium, we have the city of Ghent um, as a beautiful example. But also on a European level, um, policies are not always in line with the local level. For example, the EU sticks to industrial agribusiness instead of sustainable urban food policies. Um, it finances large-scale industrial agriculture rather than local small-scale food initiatives. On the other hand, you have, for instance, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact that works to develop um, sustainable food systems that are inclusive and, and resilient. Besides these progressive cities like Milan or, or Ghent or many more, there is also a growing number of city networks like fearless cities and, and energy cities. Energy cities, for instance, is a network of a thousand local governments in 30 countries. And it wants a radical transformation of the energy systems and politics, um, giving citizens the power to shape a decentralized and, and renewable energy future. So they trigger dialogue between citizens and local, national and EU politics and institutions to accelerate the energy transition in, in Europe. Fearless Cities, on the other hand, is a, a global municipalist movement that works on human rights, democracy and the common good. They, they organize international summits to build global networks of solidarity from the bottom up by using participatory methods. They published a guide, by the way, um, which you can download from their website. So it's pretty interesting to check it out. Now, I think there are three important domains where cities can make a big difference. There's democracy, economy, and climate. So, Democracy is being challenged, that's pretty clear. Think of the yellow vests versus President Macron in France, or the tension between Chancellor um, Angela Merkel and East Germany, or think about the global youth and adults uh, going on strike for a real climate policy. Democracy today is not able to solve these contemporary issues, so we'll need to reinvent it somehow. And this is where municipalism comes into play. The self-governance and participatory gov governance of cities, towns, and, and municipalities can, can make a big change here. Because municipalities um, help mobilize citizens to participate deeply in local problem solving. And the citizens this way become um, more of a partner against the neoliberal deregularization. Um, municipalism can also inspire 
municipal governments to share solutions with cities around the world. Um, the website municipalist.org, by the way, that I mentioned here, um, is documenting this phenomenon. So do check it out. Um, economy, the second domain. So the current economic system fails, um, as became clear already in, in 2009 after the financial crisis. Uh, also, the global markets improved the life of some at the expense of the quality of life of many others. So more and more people are advocating for an alternative economic system, one where increasing the common good for everyone becomes more important than profit for only a small group. And for this, more and more citizens are taking matters into their own hands by setting up citizen collectives or commons, as we call them, to create alternatives based on the needs of society rather than for private gain. In these commons, people work together to produce or manage what they find valuable and want to take care of on the basis of their own self-determined um, rules. Catalonia in Spain is, is an interesting example of um, an open source common based economy because it starts from the basic principles of sustainability and participation. So they're no longer working on short term or top down. These cities and regions like Catalonia are locally embedded through um, a cooperative logic, but at the same time, they are sharing their knowledge, their expertise and their technology worldwide. Um, when it comes to climate, um, this brings us to climate adaptive cities. Like here, the focus is not only on lowering CO2 emissions, but these cities are also uh, dealing with changes that are occurring already today in cities. Like the example of Nürbro uh, in Copenhagen, which, which is pictured here. So in 2018, the city of Copenhagen launched the climate adaptation project called the Soul of Nürbro. It aims to regenerate the city's inner Nürbro area, establishing new ecosystems to ease flooding, um, and at the same time, creating new social spaces uh, in the process. So it's a beautiful example of social and climate adaptive objectives brought together in a city with involvement of local citizens and even local traders. Also in Belgium, we have some great examples and I already mentioned it briefly earlier, um, the Ghent Mobility Plan. Um, so Ghent is the third largest city of the country after Brussels and Antwerp, and it has 260,000 inhabitants. Moreover, as a university city, it also counts almost an 80,000 student population. So the mobility plan in Ghent was enrolled to provide more space for pedestrians and cyclists, to improve um, the circulation of public transport, to make parking and other destinations more easily accessible, and to keep transit tra traffic out of the city center. Now, um, it's useful to know that the first steps towards a better mobility in Ghent were already made in uh, the early 90s with the implementation of a cycling policy. But even though the result was a doubling of bicycle use, the numbers were still very low. Then in the late 90s, the city rolled out its, its first mobility plan for the inner city by turning the heart of the historic center into a pedestrian zone surrounded by a parking route connecting the different parkings around the center. 
But meanwhile, the city was confronted with a steady population increase, including an exponential growth of the city's student population. And it also became an increasingly popular tourist destination. On another level, research had showed that um, more than half of all the travel in the city was taking place by car and that much of this traffic was merely transit traffic going through the city but not having its destination in the city. Walking or cycling counted for only one third of all travel and the use of public transport for barely 9%. So, in 2017, the city of Ghent implemented its circulation plan. There was a lot of fuzz about it, um, but it was primarily focused on relieving the city center of ongoing traffic. So it put a halt uh, on, on to, to transit car traffic um, through the city center. So in order to give um, more space for pedestrians, cyclists, buses, trams, and also for green space, more green space. And it did so by, first of all, extending the restricted traffic area in the center, which is here colored in pink, but then also by dividing the surrounding zone into six sections where car traffic is looped out of and rerouted via the ring roads. So driving from one section to another section or through the city center is no longer possible in Ghent. You can only go from one section to another by going out of that section through the ring road and then turning around to the next section. Um, at the same time, Efforts were made to facilitate the smooth flow of public transport. So there are now night buses, free public transport for people under 16, park and ride shuttles, and a shopping bus. Cycling infrastructure was um, extended, and this created this whole new cycling culture um, with new businesses by or for cyclists. For instance, bike couriers, bike rental services, bike repair services. The effects of the whole policy are remarkable. Um, there has been a 17% decrease in car use and an increase in public transport use of 6% on a daily basis and of 25% during evening rush hours. Bicycle use has grown with more than half. Significant improvements were also noted in terms of road safety and air quality. The number of traffic accidents in the city center decreased with 25% and nitrogen concentrations decreased with 20% on average. So in this diagram, you can see that in 2018, more than one third of trips are made by bicycle compared to one fifth in 2012. So the Ghent Mobility Plan has shown that bold policy policies aiming at social ecological transformation really can provide um, a significant answer to various challenges in terms of livability in and accessibility of the city of Ghent. So here you see a picture of a, a new underpass for cyclists um, so they can avoid the busy crossroad above. There are several of these underpasses these days in Ghent, they were recently installed. But I'll end this presentation with picture of the mosaic square in the center of Ghent a few years ago versus today. So there's also a lot more green space making the city much more livable for, for citizens. And despite the, the, 
the comments and all the fuss that there was in the beginning when when this this whole plan was announced today citizens are, are really happy with uh, the change and and you can feel it you can breathe in the city there's i mean the city is is gaining a, a lot of popularity because of because of this is just more measured to the size of the citizen and no longer um, fitted to or less fitted for cars. It's now more the citizen's city than the car's city. So thank you. Um, and I'll um, stop screening the share, uh, stop sharing the screen. It is truly impressive about Ghent and what happens in Europe. I think Ghent is near Brussels. Uh, impressive data. Car transport to drop for 70% and cycling to rise 50%. Uh, years of effort uh, so Belgium can reach this stage of urban mobility. I have heard about Ghent before the project started. In the world, a lot of cities accept this way of transformation. I hope one of our cities, uh, especially Skopje, could accept something like this to make the city center a pedestrian zone and uh, as Kati said, to use the ring rows to detour from one municipality to another. This way, the attention is set on cyclists and pedestrians. I believe public transport is well managed also. Thank you again for the nice presentation. I would like to hear some local transformations now. We have four green councillors from different parts of uh, Macedonia. Uh, first, I invite uh, Hrista Naidanov, a councillor in the city of Skopje, uh, to share practices in the city of Skopje on the topic. Thank you, Alexander, and good evening to all the participants. Thank you for the invitation to take part in this webinar and give a small contribution as a representative of DOM in the Council of the City of Skopje. Given the limited time, I will speak speak about uh, the action plan for Skopje as a green city. This is a new initiative uh, that uh, started a year and a half ago uh, in March uh, 2019 uh, under the patronage of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Skopje is the first city in North Macedonia that joined the green cities with the EBRD, uh, started the development of the action plan for a green city that will uh, help establish, prioritize, respond to the most urgent challenges regarding environment. The EBRD program for green cities uh, strives to create a better, more sustainable future for the cities and the citizens. And this is done through uh, establishing, prioritizing, connecting city challenges for environment, investing in sustainable infrastructure, adequate policies, etc. Mm, the Green City Action Plan huh, has a goal to make uh, Skopje leading sustainable city in the region, offering the citizens a high quality of life uh, through clean air, clean water, green areas, accessible for all. Uh, 
Skopje as political, cultural, economical, academic center in Macedonia is also center for industries like metal, chemical, wooden, textile, leather and printing. And the industrial development of the city is followed by development of trade, logistics, banking and many others, transport, culture, sports. In the past decades, there were efforts to develop Skopje in a different direction, in a more sustainable way. And these efforts were viewed separately and were implemented at ACTA. Today, uh, I feel the city is trying to solve those problems in a more systemic way. The approach of the Green City offers an um, integrated and multi-sectoral process where Challenges on the environment are determined periodically, depending on priorities, and they are appropriately responded to. This is achieved through green investments, uh, by giving services, regulations, valid instruments, or by changing part of some policies. I feel that through this approach, Skopje has a great potential to develop as a green city uh, on a path that leads to green growth. Uh, the acute problems persisting in the city now, as in the past, can be put in several areas. Uh, first of all, Skopje is considered, as data shows, obviously, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. Uh, and it takes its toll. Air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions mainly come from huge uh, dominance of private vehicles that use fossil fuels as well as the availability of some sort of uh, alternative transport. The public transport system is in urgent need of improvement uh, so it can be a cost-effective transport and competitive to the private vehicles so it can reduce their use. Here's one example. The city made uh, improvements this year with a decision last year from last year uh, through financial cooperation with the government uh, for the procurement of 40 new buses uh, on uh, methane and part electric. Um, this similar is the situation with the non-motorized types of transport and how to provide infrastructure especially for bikes and electric scooters uh, here there is also a small contribution in Skopje uh, of this by the city in the past two years there were 14 new bike lanes built of course, this is not enough, but the construction will continue. And also the revitalization of the existing ones. The contribution is made also by subsidies for citizens to use these transport options more often, um, like bikes and electric scooters, and that was a very successful action, especially this past year. I hope next year also it will be planned in the city budget. Energy supply and energy efficiency of residential, commercial and industrial buildings also contributes to air pollution and the green, greenhouse gas emissions. It is also connected to energy supply where not all citizens have access to the uh, central heating. Uh, but... Uh, also, there, um, the city has contributed, especially in the past two years. So, uh, all high schools under the city jurisdiction are energy efficient now. Um, in the past year, in order to reduce the emissions, the city has given um, subsidies for inverter air conditions. It's a transitional uh, period after which eventually 
um, gasification of these areas will be in place. Uh, collection and treatment of solid waste is one of the problems uh, that all cities face. Um, this has implication affecting biodiversity, e ecosystems, uh, green areas. And uh, this solid waste management can be reduced by uh, reduction of use of materials with poor quality, especially those used for heating, and uh, thus improving the air quality. Facilities for recycling, composting, separation uh, are not enough, so the city should contribute to more of these facilities. And a good example is the new waste collection system. Uh, it's functioning from last year from the center of the city to the other municipalities with bigger waste bins and modernization of the mechanization of uh, the Drissa landfill. Also, wastewater treatment contributes uh, to problems with the quality of water, soil, and this has implication on ecosystem, biodiversity. Um, we see the problem in connecting some buildings, the residential buildings, to the main sewage system. Lack of wastewater treatment plants, uh, which contributes to poor water quality in the Varda River. Uh, city of Skopje has a positive take on this uh, uh, so ongoing is the construction of a new wastewater treatment plant that will contribute to a, a lot for improvement of quality water um, as Maya the president of uh, Dom mentioned uh, urban growth urbanization in the negative context this organ Urban growth has uh, wide range implications. Improvement and protection of the land use is a common question. Examples of increased urbanization increases energy demand, transport, more solid waste. Uh, Wastewaters uh, in the business increase demand for drinking water, endangering protected areas, etc. Skopje in the past two, three years changes the way of action as, as well as the city policy in view of this and uh, increased uh, investment in green areas. Skopje invests in uh, new parks. Uh, two new ones are in the center of the city. One near the city mall and the other one is near the Philharmonic. And uh, is continuously revit revitalized revitalizing the existing parks and the uh, greening continues uh, but uh, with adequate greenery uh, which is autonomous to the region. Briefly this action plan uh, additionally will be reviewed in the sections that were described it is over 100 pages. Uh, it's worth reading and I think that um, the city of Skopje is a place of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Christa, for briefing and informing us in a short time on the work of the 
city council in the past period. I hope in next year's elections we'll have more green councillors so citizens can benefit from it. It is obvious with the two of you green councillors in the city council, the city policies slowly change and uh, we hope for bigger changes in the future. I would like to invite uh, Sretimir Nikolski, councillor from Kriva Palanka municipality. Greetings to you all. As a councillor from the Green Party and as a professional, uh, I'm obligated to take care of the environment and uh, people's health as well. Since I come from a city that uh, represents a gate to the European U U Union and our place is in the EU, and the first impression a foreigner sees in Kiva Palanka will give him a sense it's the same across Macedonia, so we need to be working for a clean, uh, green eco-city. Uh, in order for our environmental efforts to be successful, big part of the city budget is dedicated to this, um, about 15 to 17 percent, uh, 27 to 31 million dollars. A decent sum for different environmental projects. And since my first mandate and now in my second mandate as a councillor, I advocate for Kriva Palanka to be a green city, uh, caring for the green areas outside the city is one of my priorities. So I worked hard to plant trees around the city. We achieved. Uh, to plant uh, 2,500 trees and the city green has been multiplied to a substantial level. Uh, last year, over 2,000 square meters of new greenery were set up. This year, over 5,300 square meters. And we also planted about uh, 500 trees and uh, another activity in cooperation with the local utility company and that produces flowers was uh, 20,800 flowers were planted, same as the number of inhabitants of the municipality of Kriva Palanka. What I've worked on from the start was for Kriva Palanka to have clean drinking water. So um, the water supply partly with asbestos pipes to be replaced. Asbestos uh, is uh, as a toxic material uh, and cancerous. Uh, so the initiative of all our councillors was accepted by the city and the mayor. So the process of replacement of asbestos pipes um, is almost uh, finished uh, uh, for, with plastic pipes that are safe for distribution of drinking water. Among other topics, uh, I advocated for uh, shutting down, reducing, uh, cleaning the illegal landfills. And the city landfill on mm, the city outskirts is uh, uh, about to be conservated um, because a regional landfill is being constructed near Sveti Nikola for, for several cities. So in near future, this landfill, will, which is an ugly site, will be conservated. Several actions to clean illegal landfills were organized uh, uh, with different uh, names, municipality with 
without waste, uh, clean work, uh, clean community, clean municipality, in which tons of waste was collected and properly dislocated. Uh, to deal with this uh, sanitary issues, we had to provide a number of waste containers. So uh, the idea was for the utility company to uh, provide these um, containers for waste selection. And this was my commitment from the start. So in time, five uh, green containers for glass waste were procured. And this procurement was beneficial because um, this year close to five tons of glass waste was collected. Mm, a big number of glass waste indeed. Now procured were five metal cages for selection of cardboard packaging, five metal cages for plastic bottles, and two metal storages for electronic waste uh, from the company Elcomac. And collected were around eight tons of electronic waste. 50 kilo, kilograms of light bulbs and 20 kilograms of batteries, etc. This is a good number of waste selected and disposed properly. As a counselor, I worked uh, on air pollution. Even though Kriva Palanka is a clean city in winter, since primary source for heating is wood, uh, the air gets polluted. City councillors advocate for putting measuring stations and properly inform the citizens about the number of toxic particles in the air. There was a positive input, but unfortunately it's costly, so we have to wait for an investment in order to to acquire those instruments. Since wood is a primary heating choice uh, among uh, citizens, um, along with fog and emissions from the vehicles, it contributes to air pollution. Uh, so one of my priorities was uh, gasification of the city. Unfortunately, even though the main gas line passes along the city, we still don't have connections, although we have the best gasification progl program, some, some say. Uh, Finances are needed for the gasification. What was planned for commercial facilities first and followed by private housing. The latest event is the a procurement of uh, the so-called plastic mat. Uh, automated machine uh, within the project uh, for a clean city use the plastic mat uh, implemented by the northeast and plan region this plastic mat the vending machine uh, was placed so citizens can dispose of used plastic bottles and cans mm, there are not a biodegradable waste and are a serious threat to the environment. So placing this vending machine in the city center in front of the supermarket for the first time, the benefit will have all citizens that use it because using the software in the machine 
every disposed bottle is registered and with a mobile app the user can use discounts in the supermarket in front of the which the machine was placed. Uh, this way the benefit is for the citizens, for all of us, as well as the city. And finally, this is something new and interesting in Kriva Palanka. And it will be officially open for use at the end of the month. Uh, we will advocate for as many machines around the city, because plastic waste is very damaging. Um, uh, due to its uh, long period of degradation and and level of pollution to the environment. Now we'll stop here, given the time for presentation. And I thank you and wish you to stay in good health. Thank you, Stretimir. We all know you're a, a doctor, a medical worker, and currently directly dealing with the COVID crisis, and we are thanking you for it. And thank you for the fine presentation that truly really shows how initiatives in small cities can be implemented more easily. You presented a lot of initiatives and a lot of implemented projects. As I see it, it's a start of a transformation in waste and water management. Uh, thank you for the presentation. We will continue the discussion with the other councillors. But before we continue the presentations, I want to play a video that's uh, related to the topic of the next speaker. Priroda. Vozvišena ubavina. Svet na stoletni šumi, kristalno čisti vodoteci, bogata flora i fauna i pitomi srtovi koji spokojno se miluvaat so prvite sončevi zraci. Mesto kada čovekot i prirodata so vekovi neprečeno čekoreli i čekorat zajedno i go sozdali osogovski od planinski ruralen predal, što opravdano go zaslužuva epitetot zaštite. Ova je jedna od najstarite kopna na Balkanot, so relativno homogena struktura od kristalesti karpi i magmatiti, so zdadeno so tektonski nabori na zemljenata kora pred okolo 500 milijoni godini vo ranata paleozojska era. Damnešnata vulkanska aktivnost na planinata denes se ogledova vo lesnovski od krateri okolnite kupi, no i tufovite i brečite, što gordo svedočat za bezcenetata vnatrešna ubavina na planinata i se kojdnevno go ispraćaat soncato što i tako on zapad. Дури и старите саси кои одам на роварелев у тробата на осоговските планини, знаеле дека под богатата природа покрај ловото и цинкот, карпите кријат и злато и сребро. Тектонските поместување и долготрајната ерозија пак успеале како скулптор да го одстранат вишокот материјал, создавајќи скалести карпести одсеци како раткова скала и орлов камен. Тоа се местата каде денес се гнездат околу 20 ретки видови птици, меѓу кои исклучително реткиот египетски мршојадец кој гордо стои на тронот во царството на птиците. Цирковите пак, вгнездени под највисоките точки на оваа убавица, се трага од некогашната глацијална активност и освен што го полна токото на набљудувачот, се извориста на реките и потоците што ја гасат жетта на генерациите. Околу 50% од шумите на Осогово се од семено потекло и се со форма близка до природната. Необичниот сплет на габер и даб во атарот на селото Зеленград е шумски рефугиум што датира во речи си неизменета форма уште од ледената доба. А прашумски карактеристики има и буковата шума на мечкин камен што со своите вековни стебла е дом на специфични габи, птици и инсекти. Овде 
Ниве, старата дама, јасно го потврдува своето присуство на домакин со супаопската клима што во комбинација со бројните извориште и камените предели е совршен рецепт за создавање шумски тресетишта. На целото саса, каде е каменичка река го започнува својот стрмен тек, се наоѓа исклучително важно флористичко наоѓалиште каде се утврдени ретки видови, меѓу кои и примитивниот ликоподиум клаватум папрат што постои од времето на диносаурусите. Влажните и зацкриени долови на планината овозможили обстанок на многу топлолюбиви дрвенести видови. Таму се наоѓаат рефугиуми со специфични шумски заедници, како што се заедниците од Липи, Белгабер, Ореви, а на крајната југозападна страна од масивот под селото Рајчани се среќава и мала состојна од Джуджест Баден. Темно зелено, светло зелено, жолто. Само црвената боја од време на време ги дразни жителите на овој биотоп. Тука природата создала 780 потоци, рекички и реки на површина од околу 1100 км2, наречена Осоговски планини или рај на земјата. Сите тие говорат без престани никогаш не се повторуваат. А во нив со векови наназад живеат 10 видови риби, 150 видови безрбетници на нивното дно, околу 40 видови вилински кончиња и други видови на водни животни. Овде домуваат над 3000 акватични и копнени животни и растенија, а некои од нив за првпат се опишани за науката и го носат името Осоговикус, Осоговенсис или едноставно Осоговски. Слана бара, Тресетиште непосредно по од Царев врв е чувар на питката вода, а со својата ниска пеха вредност и ниска концентрација на хранливи субстанции е и дом на специфична флора, адаптирана на подолги сушни периоди и недостаток на храна. Чекорејки нагоре кон врвотруени неговите 2252 метри надморска височина, најпрво во сенките на Дабот, Јасенот, Леската и Габерот, ке сретнете околу 120 ретки и ендемични видови алги и растенија, 55 значајни видови габи, над 260 ретки и ендемични видови инсекти, а меѓународно значајни се и 14 видови водоземци и влекачи, повеќе од 100 видови птици и 30 вида цицачи. А штом ке се појави буката, веќе знаете дека стеја преминале границата од 1000 метри надморска височина. А до високопланинските се редат брдски пасишта, дабови и букови шуми, мозаично испреплетени со ливади и обработливи површини. Пред вас се нижат 28 рурални населби од разбиен тип. Секој дом традиционално е граден што подалеко од соседниот, како секое семејство да сакало да сграбчи и љубоморно да зачува за себе што поголемо парче од оваа обавина. А жителите со векови ги користат благодетите на плодната почва, се занимаваат со сточарство и одгледуваат пчели и на тој начин оставаат уникатен печат врз пределот. Мештаните знаат и за квалитетите на шумските плодови, габите и лековитите свойства на билките. А мирисот на дивата јагода го чини дури и ветерот ендемичен. На Осогово природното и културното наследство совршено се надополнуваат. Во 11 век во селото Лесново е изграден манастирот Свети Гаврил Лесновски, а старата дудинка што сгрбавено стои крај манастирските двери е жив сведок на десетици илјади из Грейсонца и исто толку за Едисонца и немо сведочи за промената на генерациите и традициите на овој предел. Ехото од Карпите останува единствениот бележник на оваа традиција на мештаните од Атарот на село Лесново. За планинарите, Осогово е питома планина. Но доколку ги прашате велосипедистите, ќе наречат дива и непредвидлива, бидеки нивните и патеките на срните, лисиците и другите шумски жители честопати се преплетуваат.
тука и само тука, ако имате трпение, ќе уживате во зеленилото на златната канделка и осоговската гениста. А може би ќе ги сретнете и живородната гуштерица, ушестата чучулига и жолтоклуната галка. Ако сте доволно брзи, може би и осоговскиот ендемичен тркач. Токму зато, а дел од овој природен дијамант во југоисточна Европа заслужува да биде заштитено подрачје во кое човекот и природата ќе продолжат и понатаму да градат хармонија. И само така, овие природни богатства ќе бидат сочувани за идните поколенија, за да можат и тие да ја создаваат и пренесуваат историјата по нас. Овие силуети на млади луѓе крај огнот сме јас, ти, вие и сите ние. А токму таа, природата, нам треба да ни подари доверба. Природата може би може и без нас, но можеме ли ние без неа? This is a beautiful video since we didn't make a break and this was a break uh, for pleasing the eyes and the soul. Uh, with the next topic I invite um, Svetlana Stanojkovska from Probištip. Congratulations on proclaiming Osogovo Mountains a protected area and hopefully this will bring a big transformation for your city and nearby cities as well, having a national park. Mm, thank you, Alexander, for the uh, invitation. I really enjoyed this video. I hope all present enjoyed this. Uh, Osogovo is a protected area proclaimed by the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning a few days ago. I'm a councillor in the municipality of Probištiv from the Green Party. Uh, Probištip is a mining city and I have a bit different presentation than what you usually hear from me. I think you will enjoy it. A protected landscape is a type of protected area. It falls into category 5 according to the International Community for Conservation of Nature. A protected area is a place where the connection between man and nature over time has created area of rare character with high ecological, biological, cultural and landscape values. In the protected area, it's most important to preserve the connection between man and nature because it's crucial and most important in protection and management of the protected area. The main goal of the protected area is to protect nature through the protection of traditional historical practices of natural resource management. Osogovo has become a protected area due to the diversity and the richness of biodiversity, geodiversity, hydrological characteristics, landscape and other values. And one of the ways in which this type of protected area works is to maintain the balance between nature and human culture by protecting the area and the way of life of the local population. The proclamation of an area as a protected area contributes to the protection of certain types of uh, uh, species and their habitats. Uh, the Radkova Skala site covers uh, 1,619 hectares and is representative of the Osogovo rural area. It has high values from a cultural and natural aspect. It's important for the conservation of birds, especially for the globally vulnerable Egyptian vulture that nests here. There is an abundance of plant species in Osagova as well. Uh, 
the Osogovo genista is a local endemic plant species found only in the Osogovo mountains and this dwarf legume with yellow flowers grows on open high mountain pastures in very small uh, areas around Tsarev uh, In the Bregalnica region you can find wolves, uh, foxes and uh, even uh, bears and wild boars. Um, this region is also home to about 50 species of mammals. A significant part of them can be found predominantly in the protected area and, uh, and have conservation status. This is especially true for the bats, of which as many as six new species has been recorded. In the Bregalnica region, a water lizard has been observed, which is from the amphibian class. Uh, as we see in the picture, the griffon vulture is our largest bird whose wingspan can reach up to 2.8 meters. It can be spotted near the Bregalnica, Crnarica and the, Crnarica, the river and in Berovo. Now, more than ever, we have the opportunity to set up new tourist practices that are safer, more environmentally friendly and more sustainable. Visitors and many people have the opportunity to try delicious local food, climb mountain peaks, breathe mountain fresh air, um, develop sport tourism as the region is rich in hiking, cycling and winter sports. Uh, which are the economical benefits, they are vast. The protected area brings with it uh, employment opportunities and socio-economic development of the area through recreation and tourism. The area is protected but is managed uh, which can offer a number of natural products and ecosystem services. Through this type of protected area, protected are local agrobiodiversity and traditional agricultural practices. Uh, as we can see in the slide, the uh, economic benefits are huge. Forest fruit pickers with planned and controlled fruit picking will provide a source of income for the coming years and their products will have higher price because they come from protected area. Uh, hotel, owner, hotel managers and caterers expect an increased number of tourists. The beekeepers will have opportunity to brand their products and the opportunity to network uh, the, with the beekeepers from the region. The mountaineers in the protected area expect to improve the conditions for mountaineering uh, through hiking trails, educating mountain guides and enriching the tourist offer uh, in all seasons. Osogovo is one of the most suitable mountains for mountain hike, biking. Uh, livestock farmers through state uh, and foreign funds will be able to improve the conditions for production of cheese and other dairy products. Farmers will have branded and recognized products produced according to the traditional practices and for that will be able to use uh, state subsidies. Uh, women farmers for their dairy products will have higher market value uh, due to the environmental origin. They will be able to use funds from the European Union and the state funds. The guard service uh, that will take care to reduce all illegal activities that harm nature Thus, will preserve the Osogovo Mountains for the future generations. There will be existence for whole families and thus the migration of uh, young people will be reduced. The protected area will provide plant development and joint promotion of the region, uh, will become recognizable and it will be possible to use earmarked funds for rural development. Protected areas are truly a boon for the whole community. Uh, we hope that Probishtip as a city will have a big benefit knowing that uh, it's a mining city. 
and there was a skepticism how it can become a green city with the um, Osagovo protected area I think it can be uh, achieved thank you for your attention thank you Svetlana I feel all will agree that your transformation is what we all strive for. Congratulations on the new national park in Macedonia. It was uh, declared a couple of days ago. It's official now. Thank you for reminding us and uh, for sharing your emotions and thoughts for the future. We continue with another presentation, uh, an urban topic. Uh, in the municipality of Aerodrom, part of the city of Skopje, we have a green councillor, our young councillor Ivana Zdravevska. Hello to everyone. Um, Thank you for the invitation. I'm councillor in the municipality of Aerodrom. I'm also working in the National Hydrometeorological Service and uh, I have a master's in agricultural sciences and management in rural tourism. As a councillor in the municipality of Aerodrom, from the start of my mandate, uh, I face different challenges, victories, defeats and the decision making. Um, as a green councillor, my vision for the municipality of Aerodrom is uh, improved quality of life of uh, all citizens, more green areas, uh, reducing pollution, improved air quality, as well as uh, providing help and better infrastructural solutions. My contribution as a councillor is based on providing assistance and counseling to citizens in my municipality who very often have a wrong perception about solving their problems and are usually regarding sanitary and waste solutions, urban solutions, as well as proposals and initiatives for different needs and problems citizens face. I'm especially proud of the cooperation with the mayor and other councillors, which unanimously have uh, voted for my amendments for subsidies of uh, bikes and air conditioners. One of the major problems uh, my municipality faces is the fast urbanization. As a councillor, I fight for a synchronized implementation of legislation in this area. With the fast and irregular growth in urbanizing space, um, accent is uh, put on construction and not uh, synchronized with green area uh, or improved air quality. And new green jobs, new parks and bike lanes, uh, as well as youth centers. As a result, uh, two detailed urban plans were approved, which I voted against, because they do, they're not in line with my vision as a green councillor, nor with the needs of the citizens that elected me and who I represent in the council. My future goals as councillor are uh, setting up solar heating panels in public facilities, opening vegetable gardens in kindergartens, planting trees and uh, taking care of the, the greeneries, as well as uh, subsidies for households for isolation of residential facilities. All these initiatives lead to one goal, improved quality of life for the citizens, as well as reducing pollution, lower electricity bills and education of the, the youngest uh, ones about organic food production. Al although this seems very easy, my experience showed it it's not. But if you are honestly fighting for something significant for the community we live in, uh, we shouldn't give up. 
only with the dedication, persistence and the will together we can achieve our common goal to live in a clean and healthy environment. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you Ivana for the presentation. Uh, I would uh, just like to remind you since many of the counselors were present at the first event that the project led uh, by GIF is um, uh, led by Kati, uh, the project leader, is about transformative practices in parts of uh, Europe where networks of cities exist. Um, they take each other's experiences uh, on energy, economy, as Kati mentioned, and uh, social issues uh, also. So in the next period, the project will map even more such practices in Europe and counselors, we have access to them and uh, if interested uh, to implement them in their cities. I have a question for Kati. Uh, since you shared a good example for us, the experience how transport can be transformed to public transport, biking and pedestrians, uh, that is something we want to see in our cities. You have um, mentioned several times the process at the beginning was challenging and difficult, so I want to know what challenges in planning the project and the implementation were faced and and whether the support of the citizens was there in the start or was there hesitance and how they achieved to involve all the citizens in supporting the process because support from the local population is really important when planning transformations like this Yes, so um, recruiting citizens to uh, adhere to the project was uh, very important. Um, in the beginning, people and especially local traders were very much against it because um, making the city center car free, they, they saw it as a big problem for their business because they thought they needed cars um, that otherwise people could not reach them and and same was for shops there was a lot of protest um, but the the local um, counselors did go through with it the, the the city went through with it but it was a participatory process so they um, they asked for the opinion of the, the the younger people the students the older people um, the, the, the working people, the people living there, the people not living in Ghent. So uh, there was a lot of um, interviews and a lot of research um, for, for their opinion on it. And they were also informed of every step of the way. And it was, of course, very gradually implemented. The first steps were already taken in the early 90s. And now we are 2020. So it was step by step. Um, and gradually the people saw that actually the people did not uh, stay away from the city center. It was not a problem at all. In, on the contrary, the city of Ghent became even more and more popular. And, and if you go there now, um, all restaurants, well, not now, but um, in a normal situation, all restaurants are full. There's, there you can, there's a lot of people walking in the city of Ghent just because it is so, so nice. It's such a nice city. It was the city was returned to the citizens, um, and it it is no longer uh, in the possession of the the cars. Um, 
And so even after every step, there were new um, uh, questionnaires sent to the people um, to ask for their opinion and to see where they needed to improve certain things. Um, because in the beginning, there was uh, a lot of protest because the public transport was not fitted enough to the, 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 the cuts for the cars. So they needed to, to work on that, but they did. So there were um, a lot of improvements along the way that, that were implemented. Um, um, and, and the citizens input was very important for that. Um, thank you, Kati. Uh, Maya, thank you for the nice question. It's really interesting, this issue with Ghent. I have a short question as well. Uh, since I've heard of this project before I started working uh, with GIF, is it true that uh, in Ghent there are people that are deciding to... Um, give up ownership of vehicles. Well, yes, um, because public transport is, is has improved a lot and because there's a lot of investments has been done uh, into cycling infrastructure. Um, people indeed uh, start using their cars less and less. And I mean, I even feel the same in Brussels. I live in Brussels and, and without this whole policy of the, the circulation policy, um, we're not that far yet, but we're also investing in, in, these, um, in this different mobility. And you feel that, that the pressure to use the car is, is slowing down and it becomes just more um, pleasant to just take a bicycle because often it's faster than a car and you pay a lot of money for a car in the end and it's we see a lot of um, initiatives of car sharing initiatives um, so so there's in Ghent there's this beautiful initiative car sharing initiatives of of electrical vehicles so there's there's a whole new movement um, that that grows alongside the circulation or the mobility plan that just strengthens the whole movement um, and the whole switch to a new mode of transportation uh, thank you for the answer i hope councillors present here in the future will take these initiatives and establish cooperation with our partners from other countries and maybe in their own way will implement these examples develop project ideas in municipalities throughout Macedonia mm, uh, any other comments Alexander and Yushev from municipality of Karpos in Skopje A question for Kati. How much uh, does uh, living in Ghent cost? What is the tax uh, on a 60 square meter apartment? So what uh, percentage is uh, this uh, from uh, the average um, pay of um, Belgian citizens um, because uh, I feel that uh, living in a smart city is expensive so the question is are people uh, in Skopje prepared to live in such a city uh, if we want to live in a city like that, uh, it will cost us. In that case, on um, election day, uh, 
no one demanding this would uh, win a vote. Uh, so you're in a m mystical circle. We want a smart city. Uh, all the commodities, commodities of modern living, but we are not uh, prepared to pay for it since our standard is low, but also on a conscious level, not everyone is prepared to open the wallet. 95% uh, of the population is not prepared to pay for that. Let's maybe call it luxury. It's not luxury, but for residential buildings not to be constructed and not to have aggressive urbanization, costs uh, need to be covered uh, from other sources, uh, among which uh, property taxes uh, will rise, uh, taxes flowing from central to local management. In order to achieve uh, this goal, which looks good and is uh, successful, uh, here, here in our country we have to change a lot of things. So, these parameters are asked uh, about uh, how high is the tax in Ghent for a 60 square meter uh, apartment. This is an, an entry, entry parameter for us to know what we want to achieve and how to, to get there. Okay, um, well, first of all, I don't know the figures. Um, that I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of, but it is a fact that um, these developments in, in Ghent have caused that um, the, the prices of houses and apartments went up uh, a lot, mm -hmm. by a lot. Um, so these measures do need to be um, combined with social measures so that certain people don't fall out. So it is, impo it is important to integrate the social aspect in, into every uh, sustainability uh, project or environmental uh, project because transition always needs to be just and that is something that the, the city of Ghent did think about as well to to take everyone along so that the the elderly people the the the, the poor families would not um, be deprived from their their um, the, the the things that they that they had before so it's a, a give and take. So, so the um, the city of Ghent did provide social measures um, to protect these poor families or, or elderly people, so that they would not be shut out of the the whole transition. Um, but I cannot give give figures. Unfortunately, I'm I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, but it's also these these questionnaires after every step of the way that uh, gave the city insight in the situation of all these different people and and that gave them um, a reason to to improve certain aspects and yes financing uh, or, or social measures is, is definitely part of that um, to make it affordable for everybody uh, thank you kathy uh, uh, the point is if, if you want to live in the uh nice cities we want we need to pay something not only migrate in skopje uh extra migration extra migration everything's happened here extra migration a lot of people comes here so we need to be prepared to, to pay the price for that or i don't know that was the point of my nation before thank you mm, thank you kati thank you and uh, this was a crucial aspect of transformation of course kati is uh, leader of the project and has 
mapped uh, perhaps 10, maybe 50 transformative uh, practices around Europe. She researches intensively, she is familiar with the problem, but Alexander Angushev comes from one of the <laughs> richest municipalities in Macedonia, municipality of Karpush in uh, the city of Skopje, um, with the biggest uh, debt uh, as well. And, uh, I wanted to say that uh, this will be a good momentum for uh, communication in the future. Um, all of us involved in the project are open to you since goal of the project is to show our transformative practices as well in Western Balkans as well as to see what Europe has has. So with this type of communication in the next year or two we can get to some starting solutions at least. Olgica from municipality of Kumanovo wants to say a few words. Uh, I will not speak about the problems Kumanovo faces. When I come to Skopje I feel it's a metropolis uh, with uh, order. Uh, listening to you, I see you have problems. Um, what has been done in the past 30 years in Kumanovo regarding urbanization, pollution, industry, streets, you feel like you're in the middle of a used car market. As Angushev said it, well, uh, try and find the pedestrian lane. <laughs> I walk on the street. Uh, this is another topic. I just want to mention it. I often hear uh, citizens of Skopje complain about migration as everything is concentrated in Skopje and it's not uh, the young people's fault. Uh, I know their troubles and they buy tiny apartments so they wouldn't uh, travel for work from Kumanovo to Skopje although they don't like the city. Regarding all your presentations, since I work in education, I'm pleasantly surprised by my students from rural areas that uh, they tell me they are more often moving uh, from Kumanovo, building nice houses. I feel in the next period for those that are wealthier, uh, who can afford it, uh, they will leave even Kumanovo and uh, move uh, to um, cottages and uh, uh, rural mountain areas and they live there. In Kumanovo, uh, the problem is uh, the urban plan arranged to traffic needs. At a recent conference, uh, I will share what functions in the world Kati can tell about Brussels. Uh, it was an example about Paris. Uh, why uh, not move the vehicles away from the city? Um, there was an initiative for vehicle pollution stickers. Uh, why drop this idea? Uh, we should revive that idea. As I cannot believe uh, the numbers, 62%, but uh, let's trust the World Health Organization. We uh, we use uh, wood for heating, uh, also in Skopje. Mm, the urban planning is poor. Uh, people in Gazibaba are most affected. Um, it's where industry was uh, located. Simply, we cannot compare... Like Anjushev says, in 30 years maybe we'll catch up with Brussels. But let's start with the simple steps. Since we have different uh, culture and consciousness. For example, 
cycling for Skopje is a good idea, but for Kumanovo, with all the uphill terrain, cycling is hard to promote. The natural terrain and the location is relevant also for the pollution. Regarding pollution, as I as I move through Skopje, crossing uh, Partizanska Boulevard as a pedestrian, I have I have uh, some sort of view of mountain Vodno Skopje. But in Kumanovo, we've created an artificial valley. First time what I saw in Skopje was the black snow. The past period we didn't have city transport, so wondered how snow can turn black. But uh, in the past period, Skopje was smaller. Kumano was even smaller, 115,000 inhabitants 30 years ago. But with the illegal constructions and the expansion... I uh, think we need to revisit the idea of uh, vehicle pollution stickers. Maybe Kati can tell us if this functions in Ghent or Brussels. I know it works in Paris. You have uh, days with bands and you only drive in the uh, designated days. Uh, let's start with the simple things, and that's my thought. And uh, to agree with Andrushev, we are in a good, uh, closed uh, circle. Voters will be turned away if we cut uh, to uh, strict measures. But uh, I should repeat, it's uh, all about uh, raising awareness. As Kati said, it's very important to be close to citizens and ask uh, questions, and give polls, and, uh, and do a lot of work. That's what we need uh, to raise awareness, uh, and it's done nicely with the uh, explanations, not just by saying uh, yes to the to the poll without knowing the facts. This process, as I heard, started in the 90s, so we need to start it already. Uh, talk to neighbors, uh, should they think about wood heating and pollution, etc. We lack this on a national and local level, I believe so. Uh, thanks to Kati, but we are far from their example, but from the discussion I realize I'm on the right track with my thoughts uh, of the need of uh, 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 polls communicating with people, explaining uh, the nicely and uh, transparency, and that is what we lack in every sense. Thank you once again, Kati. And these are my thoughts. I uh, I can do it in the educational process. I it, I trained students how to monitor from the website of the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning um, the air pollution. And uh, since we educate online currently, a student near. Um, measuring station uh, joint and another from a different city location uh, through uh, air care app uh, and uh, since I trained them how to monitor the air pollution through the application and uh, the Ministry of Environment website and which is official website um, uh, our, our analysis confirmed that near the measuring station and the air care app showed same values. Unlike the measures there, at my location, my, my school's location, they were much higher. But what should I complain for when walking through Kumanovo I see a lot of people burn wood for heating, 
there's a lot of vehicles um, oil from the fast food industry is burned um, it's the same story everywhere, not just in Komanovo. We generally need uh, state regulations for wood uh, for heating. Maybe maybe I, I discuss a bit harshly uh, my educator by vacation, but I wanted to express what I feel we lack the most. Thank you all. Thank you to Kati once again. Thank you, Olgitsa. You didn't waste time. You expressed relevant concerns. I I want to reply to Olgitsa's comment. I agree with your comment about the stickers. Two years ago, and the proposal for amendment of the law was given, and it stated obligatory stickers for polluters in in traffic: red, yellow, green. What happened in a long debate for months, uh, the proposal was stuck in parliament discussions with negative comments. Uh, me and uh, Liliana Popovska, my colleague from DOM, a parliament member, uh, since we believe it's a good solution, we defended it. But in the end, they left the sticker regulation passed, but not obligatory, but as a choice by the citizens, because the public pressure and the opposition, even the position that suggested it, withdrew, so the changes were accepted and the sticker made uh, non-obligatory. So I agree here, communication with the public is very important if we started communicating earlier and explained about the benefits for all of us maybe we wouldn't have such negative stance and uh, a better legal legal better legal solution would have been found i just uh, wanted to explain the issue around the proposal for the amendment of the law I will just rephrase the question from Olgitsa Dukati. Does um, Belgium, Brussels, Ghent has uh, categories for vehicles depending on the pollution they generate? Uh, the proposal in our country was for vehicles to have um, a green, yellow or red sticker depending on the level of pollution. They create with the red being the high polluters so in specific days they don't circulate in traffic and the ones with green stickers have a pass through the week non-stop in in belgium we don't work with stickers but we do have low emission zones like ghent brussels antwerp the biggest cities are low emission zones so mm -hmm. highly polluting cars cannot enter the city any longer so they cannot enter the city at all yes i think it's a practice throughout europe here however as olivera said and my explained well the start is making the vehicles and marking the vehicles slowly those who pollute the most will be put out of uh, use and this probably was a practice decades ago in Europe, but we need to implement it in our country now. We are having good discussion, so if anyone else has something to add, please do. Oliver Toshevsky from Kumanovo has a comment. If you hear me, I'll be brief. I'm a member of the Green Party Dom from Kumanovo, uh, representing the business sector in Kumanovo. Uh, the whole discussion that we had was, in a way, giving uh, complaints from all of us. Uh, no matter what city we talk about, Skopje, Kumanovo. 
I think we need to give give accent what steps uh, we can do to spread our green idea in Macedonia. We are all aware of uh, the situation here as well around the world. Mm, not to mention the green gas emissions, the heating issues. We need to start acting in order to develop it in a green society. This was a brief comment on my part. Let's start action now. Greetings to all. Thank you for the brief comment. I think Yushif mentioned in the next aspect and Kati confirmed uh, that a municipality should have a big budget to implement these green policies and measures. But uh, if we know in advance, for example, the city of Skopje and the bike lanes, it would be nice as it's a practice this past two years. Every boulevard and main road that gets reconstructed to have a wide bike lane, which is a good practice, and that uh, we in future uh, we can create a network of bike lanes and increase the mobility. Um, I live in a part of the city where it's accessible, the western part of Skopje, it's connected by bike lanes. If we have any other comments? Vasilka from Skopje, from the municipality of Cent uh, Center. I would like to share a good uh, initiative. I know some of uh, you are familiar with my work in the civil sector and my work on school projects. I think it's a good way to achieve something because uh, we need to work a lot on education. I work with the uh, CSO Slow Food, and uh, it's the third year that we lead a project with schools for uh, vegetable gardens. It was financed by the city of Skopje for two years, and the, um, last year by the Ministry for Environment. The project is well received in the schools, and in my experience from the three years involved, I think we should help in institutionalizing this this uh, project idea to ask the Ministry of Education to make it uh, part of the educational program only in that way it will be it will serve its purpose to the maximum and be sustainable thank you Vasilka I know the work you do and uh, it's truly a transformative practice uh, with urban gardens in schools and um, thank you for the comment Divna mm. Vidic has a comment mm. I joined a bit uh, late I don't know if uh, waste separation was mentioned on city level not just Skopje but all municipalities in the country I think we pay very little attention to it. And households are not used to separate waste. And we behave uh, carelessly. Waste is one of the biggest polluters in cities. We should work on raising uh, awareness about the, the importance of waste separation. And it's time to start the process of uh, waste uh, separation. And long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, 
I was in Italy for three months, and even then every household was uh, obligated by law to separate waste and uh, leave it for collecting in that manner. Citizens in our ca country dispose of waste in a f free manner, not minding the designated areas for that, and usually there are no penalties for that. I think we are going backwards in this area. There was a time when Skopje was one of the cleanest cities. Now it's uh, very dirty. It's very important for our tourist centers uh, like Struga, the, the municipality of Struga, where I often go in summer uh, for the coastline to be clean. It's um, it's dirty and uh, councillors in municipalities should pay attention to the process of waste collection and separation. It should start uh, even in kindergartens as a process of uh, raising awareness among the youngest ones after in schools and so on. It's time, if we speak about uh, clean cities, to start with the waste and separation and uh, by legal obligation and afterwards uh, it's uh, repurpose and uh, recycling. Uh, I can't remember, uh, besides uh, Pakomak, uh, another company that uh, recycles it's uh, they they pack and send plastic waste to another destination since I don't uh, recall that we have a company in Macedonia that recycles repurposes or reuses plastic any kind of plastic waste or any kind of waste it applies to any type of waste not just what I mentioned the plastic um, to, uh, with the reuse of other types of waste, not only awareness can be raised, but improvement in hygiene will be achieved in the city, uh, decrease pollution and create new jobs with repurposing and recycling waste. Thank you. Thank you, Divna. I uh, agree with you. We pay very little attention to recycling. As I can see, during the years, recycling is voluntary, with uh, separation bins on uh, main streets in Skopje for plastic, glass and electronic waste. Uh, and citizens recycle on a voluntary basis. They have at least a disposable, disposal point. Um, I want to mention our colleagues from uh, Go Green. Uh, in the past period, they had an interesting initiative so with um, you know, putting uh, like uh, some sort of cardboard boxes in residential buildings, uh, initiating voluntary recycling um, that a lot of buildings applied for, and uh, the organizers put the the uh, boxes, and when they are full, they collect them. It shows that citizens are aware uh, recycling is good for the environment and the city and uh, it improves quality of uh, life. And I think in future we need to work on uh, this issue more and develop ideas that can move us towards a larger scale of uh, waste separation and recycling. Thank you, Divna. I just want to mention that Kati is um, available for questions or informations during the whole uh, project uh, duration as uh, well as uh, the other European partners so uh, we can contact them directly. With this, I want to conclude this event. 
we will stay in touch. You will be informed about the project results by mail, but you can reach me by phone anytime. All information collected within the project regarding uh, Western Balkans uh, will be available as well as from the European partners, so you can use this in your work. Thank you for joining us. I invite you on uh, December 15th to join us on another event related uh, to energy, transformation towards uh, energy democracy, also organized by Sunrise CSO together with the Green Foundation. And I hope to see you all then. Thank you and goodbye.